make sure I'm on here. I think so. Nope. Yes. There we go. Awesome. Well, good morning again and happy new year. Yes. It's man, I haven't talked to you yet in the new year. By now you've had a chance to break all your New Year's resolutions. You know, so <laughs> if you made any. I don't make any anymore. You know. I, I made one a few years back. I made a resolution not to make any resolutions and I've done really well at that. So I don't make resolutions anymore because I find the whole premise behind it um, just wrong, just off. You know, the whole premise behind a New Year's resolution is, I suppose, there's some good to a resolution if you're trying to improve your health, you know, or maybe eat better. And there's no problem with with determining, I mean, a resolution to to get to know Christ better. There's nothing wrong with that kind of resolution. But most of the time, the resolutions that people make are, are self-serving at best. And, and the premise behind any resolution is somehow that we're lacking in some way. Somehow we need to improve something. And we as Christians, you know, I, I used to go to a church where they kind of encouraged resolutions, you know, so you could improve yourself. And you know what? All that is is pride. Let me tell you something. As far as God's concerned, you don't need to improve anything in you. You don't have to do anything to impress God. You don't have to do anything to please God because in Christ Jesus, we have been made accepted in the beloved. You are accepted by God just the way you are. You are righteous and you are holy. So, Part of what I would like to do this year, you know, it's, it says in the word that, that the church has been given gifts. You know, we've been given pastors and teachers. And those people have been placed in the body to help equip the saints. And so I take that as um, part of what my calling is. My calling is to share things with you that God is sharing with me that will equip you. Equip you for what? Equip you for life. Equip you for living this new holy life that you have been given. And some of that, some of the equipping that needs to be done is, is a repentance. And when I say repentance, I don't mean groveling over your sins. I mean, it's a changing of our, your mind. And that's what repentance means. It means change your mind. And we have lived so many years, and the church has taught so many years of legalese, uh, you know, a Christianese language. We have all these lovely, beautiful words that we use, and we don't really even know what they mean. And so what I would like to do, you know, at least part of this year, is to look at some of these Christian words and to give us some accurate definitions. We say things like, we have been made holy. And we say things like, God is holy. But do we even know what holiness is? What is the definition of holy? Now we all have something in our mind. Because most of us have come out of churches. And I was talking with Randy, and I was, I was telling him I was going to talk about holiness today. And he said, holiness, yuck. You know, yuck. He said, who wants to be holy? Because, see, in Randy's mind, he remembers a little lady that used to come to a church we attended, and she was holy. I mean, you just, she would walk in the room and she was holy. And she was holier than anybody who ever lived. 
You know, she was one of those holier than thou people. And so when Randy hears the word holy, he thinks, yuck, who wants to be like that? See, and, and the idea that we are so good, you know, we are so holy, and that we're no worldly good, we're so holy that no one can even approach us. And that's not what holiness is at all. That's not what it means. So there are some definitions. Paul Ellis has like seven definitions. We're going to go through some of them. Seven useless definitions of holiness. And I thought that was great. Useless definitions of holiness. What is holiness? Well, for most of the church, when you talk about holiness and ministers who preach holiness, they preach holiness as sin avoidance. See, if you can just avoid sin, then you are holy. See, that is actually the definition of the tree of good and evil. That is actually the temptation that Adam and Eve fell into, was the avoidance of evil. See, Adam and Eve looked at the tree of good and evil and they said to themselves, huh, if I can just eat of this tree and avoid the evil and eat the good, then I'll be holy like God. They didn't recognize that the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, the evil side was just as much part of the tree as the good side. And so mankind has fallen into this trap thinking that avoiding sin is holiness. But it really is just falling into the trap that the enemy laid. And when we live our life thinking that holiness is avoiding sin, we end up in two different places. Either we end up prideful because we are so much holier than anyone else, or we end up condemned because we just don't measure up. So the idea that holiness is sin avoidance is not a good definition. And especially when we say God is holy. If holiness is sin avoidance, how does that fit with God? God has always been holy. God is holy. He was holy long before there was any sin to avoid. So you see, defining holiness as Sin avoidance is kind of like calling light the absence of darkness. It doesn't really tell you what it is. It doesn't really define it. So saying that holiness is sin avoidance is a terrible definition because we can't apply that definition to God at all. It doesn't make sense. And if we could avoid sin to become holy, we wouldn't have needed a savior. We could have made ourselves holy by just living good enough. And we know that can't be because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We needed a savior. We needed a savior because we could never attain holiness through our actions. We could never avoid sin because we were lost in it. We were by nature sinful. That was our nature that we received from Adam. We needed someone to free us from that nature, and that freedom came through Jesus Christ. So holiness is not sin avoidance. Now, sin avoidance might be a fruit of holiness, but it is not the root of holiness. Avoiding sin doesn't cause you to become holy, but your holiness will cause you to avoid sin. This, it's, it's a small difference, but it's huge in how we walk in this life. So know that holiness is not sin avoidance. That's not a good definition. So someone else might say holiness is being set apart from sin. That's sometimes churches will use that being set apart from sin, then you're holy, being set apart from sin. And there's some truth to that, because we have been set apart from sin. Sin has been separated from us by God. But 
we're not supposed to, you know, there's a verse that says come out from them and be separate. But you know what? If we come out from the world completely and are separate, no one's ever going to hear about Jesus. So God is not calling us to avoid the world. He's calling us to walk in it victorious. He's calling us to walk out our holiness in the world. See, the church is this idea that somehow sin can corrupt holiness. I've heard it taught that, you know, God can't look on sin. And I know I used to attend a church where, you know, we had to, you couldn't go out and mingle among the people. There are some churches like that where you never see the pastor before the service or even after the service, because he can't mingle with the people in case the anointing gets tainted, you know. And it, it's the idea that holiness can be corrupted by sin. That somehow God couldn't look at sin because somehow it would corrupt him. And that's just foolishness. Here's the truth about holiness. Sin does not corrupt holiness. Holiness destroys sin. And so the reason that God said, you know, no, no, it's better for the Israelites to stay over on that side of the fence is because he knew that should his holiness break forth, it would have destroyed those people. And so he said, no, it's better for them to stay back. It's not that God cannot be in the presence of sin. It's that sin cannot abide in the presence of God. And that's why when his Holy Spirit came into you, Sin left you. Sin has no part in you. There's no shadow of darkness in you. There's no turning in you. You are just like God in that respect. Your spirit and his spirit have become one. And there is no sin left in you. Because sin cannot live in the presence of God. And God is living in you. So, sin, holiness is not necessarily being set apart from something. And then, another, on the other hand, they say holiness is being, set to, is being set to God. You know, being dedicated to God. That's what holiness is. And that's a great definition if you're talking about dedicating the temple or dedicating the cups and saucers in the temple or dedicating things. Things are set apart to God. But, you know, as, as a definition of holiness, that doesn't quite play out because God is holy. And we can't really say, well, God is set apart to God. How does that work? See, it's not a great definition of holiness. Holiness can't be defined as being set apart from something and it's not can't be defined as set apart to something. It's not really. It's partially correct, and that's like a lot of these definitions have a little bit of truth, but it's not the complete truth. And so they don't they fail because most of them can't be applied to God Himself. The one we hear most often um, in church is that. Holiness is moral perfection. And that's somehow, that's what we're striving for. Moral perfection. And then we get back into that holier than thou thing. If, if, if holiness was moral perfection, then we're all messed up, people. There's only one who was morally perfect, and his name is Jesus. And he came and he lived that life for you so that you would not have to meet that standard. In fact, um, the early Christian church, when Paul came to them and talked to them about, you know, well, what do we have to have the Gentiles do? Because the Jews in the congregation were saying, well, we have to have these people follow all the laws of Moses. And um, Peter stood up and said, or James, James stood up and said, you're going to put burdens on them that we couldn't even keep? No, that's, that, that's not the standard we're going to put on these people. Holiness is not moral perfection. That idea comes straight out of the law. 
and Jesus came and fulfilled the law so that you would no longer be judged by the law and no longer be under the curse of the law. Holiness is not moral perfection. Holiness is so much more than just behavior. And like we said before, behavior can never make you holy. It could never do that. And then some people say, well, holiness is righteousness. But Jesus is called the holy and righteous one. They're two separate things. Holiness and righteousness cannot be used interchangeably or else, you know, Jesus, why would we just not say the righteous one? Why would we say the holy and righteous one? Why would we be redundant? God doesn't waste words like that. Jesus is the holy one and the righteous one. And you have been made holy and righteous. And they're two separate things. But how many of us have ever sat down and looked at the definition in the Greek to see what it really means? See, our language has changed over time. And um, words that they used when King James wrote this out have come to mean different things than they did when it was written in the Greek. So we, it's really important when you're reading a translation you know it's great to have more than one translation um, but man I have found that sometimes I'm reading a translation I like to go back and see what it said in the King James and I like to go look what it says in the Amplified and when all else fails I go back to the Greek I go back to the Strong's Concordance because a lot of what we've been taught has come through the tradition of men and has given us a wrong idea, just like this word holiness. Now, some people would say holiness is godliness, which is another word. Well, what is that? What is godliness? You know, it's like sitting, well, we say God is holy. I mean, if holiness is godliness, then we would say God is godly. You know, it doesn't mean anything to say that holiness is godliness. It becomes just trite and empty, and it loses its meaning if we say that. So godliness isn't a particularly useful definition of holiness. Now the one definition that I did find in the Greek that does apply to God is holy, holiness means worthy of devotion. Now, that is a definition that we can apply to God. Because holiness means you are worthy of devotion. And God is truly worthy of our devotion. All the devotion that there is. Now, the problem with this definition then is, well, what about other holy things? Because you know, angels are holy. But... Angels aren't worthy of devotion. Angels aren't worthy of worship. In fact, we're told specifically not to worship the angels. And God calls you holy. And I'm sorry, I'm not worthy of devotion. <laughs> you know, please don't worship me. Oh, Lord. Uh, so see that definition, that one even falls short. When, it, when we try and apply it to ourselves, it doesn't work. So, where does that leave us? Well, finally, we get into um, defining what holiness is. Well, before I do that, you see, holiness kind of ends up like that old parable of the blind men touching the elephant. You know, you remember that one? One blind man fills the elephant's leg and says, oh, an elephant is like a tree. And then another blind man grabs the ears and said, no, an elephant is like a fan. 
and the third one grabs the trunk and says, no, an elephant is like a snake. And then another one grabs the tail and says, so you're all wrong. The elephant is like a rope. See, it's all, all of these little things have a piece of what holiness is, but none of them are the complete thing. So we need to look in the Strong's Concordance. We need to go to the Greek and find out what holiness means. And holiness at its basis means whole. So it means wholeness. It means complete. And when we talk about the holiness of God, and I apologize for that, when we talk about the completeness of God, God is completely complete. He is perfectly perfect. He is beautifully beautiful. He is the whole package. He is all sufficient. He lacks nothing. There's nothing that God needs. He contains it all. His holiness is not a part of his characteristic. See, you know, we, you know, you talk about people. Well, this generosity, um, kindness, those are parts of their character. But holiness is the whole of who God is. It's like saying God is love. It's not a part of who he is. It's the whole of who he is. And holiness encompasses the entirety of what God is. It's all of his glory. And it's all of his power. And it's all of his being. We say God is holy. That's what he is. That's who he, he is. And when we see that, the holiness of God, it stands in stark contrast to the brokenness of the world. There's nothing broken in God. There's nothing blemished in God. There's nothing damaged in God. There's nothing flawed at all. He is perfectly perfect. And if we can see that, there's hope in that. Because what has Jesus Christ did? Jesus Christ has made us part of the beloved. He has made us accepted in the beloved. He has placed his spirit within us. He has made us one spirit with perfect. He has made us one spirit with holy. He has made us one spirit with wholeness. He has made us one spirit with completeness. In him you are complete. Now the world would tell you that you lack. And the world focuses on our lack. The world focuses on our sickness. The world focuses on our poverty. It focuses on our turmoil and our anger and our anxiety. The world focuses on all of our imperfections. But God created us to focus on his holiness. God created us to find our completeness in his completeness. God created us to be made whole within his wholeness. And if we can see that the God of the universe, the all-sufficient one, the holy one, the perfect one, the complete one, is on our side and loves us, that gives us hope. How can you have a lack when the God of all provision is on your side? How can you have anxiety when the God of all peace is your Father? God always planned for man to find his identity in God. That's why God came every day and spoke with Adam in the garden. He spoke every day. And he brought all the animals to Adam for Adam to find a companion. And in all reality, God just wanted Adam to find his companionship in God. That's really what God wanted. 
was for Adam to recognize that his true companionship would be found in God. And that's the same way for us. God wants us to recognize that our true companionship, our true completeness, our true sufficiency, our true identity, our self-worth, if you want to call it that, rest in Jesus. He is the ideal. He is the ideal that we have become. The word says that when we see him, we will be like him. When we see Jesus, we will be like him. And the word says that grace and peace are multiplied to us through the knowledge of Christ. You know, earlier we talked about what would be a good resolution. A good resolution would be to spend your time getting to know Jesus better. Because the better you get to know Jesus, the more grace and peace are multiplied to you. Not just added, multiplied exponentially. You know, grace, there is nothing deeper than grace. I had someone say to me one time, ah, you know, grace, that's pretty, that's rather simplistic. <laughs> I'm like, what? How can you say that? There is nothing deeper than grace. There's nothing simpler than grace. But it's deep. It's deep. And if we can begin to grasp the grace of God, we will begin to grasp the love that God has for us. And we've begun, but man, it can be multiplied. It can be multiplied, this understanding, this revelation. You know, and I would think, you know, the revelation of grace, it's, it's one of those things, once you see it, you can't unsee it. But the idea that there is more revelation in this grace, that it can be multiplied, that there's more to this, much more. That makes me excited. Because recognizing grace, the idea that God loves me, that he has saved me, that he accepts me just the way I am, that he doesn't demand anything of me, that I owe him nothing. See, that goes against the religious teaching I had because the way I grew up, it was like, well, Jesus did all of this for you. Don't you, shouldn't you do all of this for him? That's what I was taught. But the Word of God tells us that Jesus Christ removed from us even the, our iniquity which means even our debt. He paid the debt that we owed because truthfully, this was a debt we couldn't pay. So why are we so foolish as to teach people that they owe God something? It's not something you can pay back. And you don't have to, yes? That takes the weight off of that scripture that always seemed heavy to me. Be holy, ah. I am holy. Yes, be holy. You know, always a heavy scripture because how he's saying, be whole, as I am holy. Exactly. I'm glad you brought that up because that is in my notes. Jesus said that to us. Be holy. He was speaking to the Jews and he said, be holy, as, as our Father in heaven is holy. And they all went, what? You know, and Jesus told them, you know, that your righteousness had to exceed the righteousness of the Pharisees. And they were like, what? Because nobody was more righteous than the Pharisees. What was Jesus doing when he said that? Be ye perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. What was Jesus doing? Jesus was extending an invitation. 
an invitation to the listeners. He was saying, come to me. Put your trust in me, and I will make you holy. Come and share with me the life that I share with my Father. See, Jesus Christ is our example of the complete man, a whole man. Jesus knew who he was. He came into this earth and he read the scriptures and he knew who he was. He knew what he was called to do. He called his father, Father. Nobody referred to God as Father in the Old Testament. That was not a revelation they had. But Jesus had that revelation. And he knew that he was God's son. And Jesus walked in this earth like nobody ever had. And everyone was astounded at his teaching. They said, man, this guy teaches with authority. This guy knows who he is. This guy, I mean, Jesus had charisma. He, he spoke with authority. The demons listened to him. He commanded sickness to go and it went. He called a coin into a fish's mouth and it came. He said blind eyes open and they opened. Nobody had ever seen anything like that. But Jesus was able to do those things not because he was God, but because he was a man who knew who he was. He was a man who knew who his father was. He was a man who knew that God was backing up his word. And as he is, so are we in this world. Jesus knew that he was the Holy One. He knew that he was the Righteous One. He stood in the temple and he said, this day, this scripture has been fulfilled in your sight. I have been anointed to preach deliverance to the captives, to open the blind eyes, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to declare the glorious year of the Lord. Jesus knew what his anointing was. And we are God's children. And we need to come to the place. We need to come to the same place Jesus did at the River Jordan when the heavens opened and the dove came down and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Every believer needs to have that as rhema in their heart, as a revelation in their heart. You are God's child and in you, he is well pleased. Amen. God is pleased with you. And when Jesus Christ heard those words from his father, he had not performed one miracle. He hadn't ministered to one person. He hadn't done one thing. And God was pleased with him. God identified him, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. And you know what? We do a lot of disqualifying of ourselves. We say to ourselves, well, yeah, that was Jesus, but I'm not Jesus. I'm not Jesus. And you know what? We need to repent of that kind of thinking. We need to change our minds. Because we have been made a holy people. We have been made kings and priests. We have been set apart for God. We have been made holy. We have been made complete, lacking nothing. You lack nothing in your spirit. 
Your spirit is complete and whole. It is as complete and whole as Jesus Christ himself. Yes. See? Man, I used to, oh man, so many things I have to unlearn, you know. I used to go to this church and they taught, well, you know, we got this little baby spirit, you know, and you got to, it's just got to grow up. No, that's ridiculous. You receive the Spirit of God. It is full grown and functioning. The Holy Spirit is not some baby spirit in you. It is full grown and functioning in you completely. And it has made you whole and complete. Oh, and then there was that other one, you know, you got these two natures fighting in you. You got the old nature and you got the Spirit of God and they're fighting and which one wins? The one you feed the more. No, come on. As though the old nature could overpower and taint the Spirit of God. Impossible. Where the Holy Spirit is, there is freedom. You have been set free from your old nature. Hallelujah. You have been severed from that thing. It is no longer you. You have become a new creature in Christ Jesus. Behold, all things are new. The old things have passed away. Dead is dead. Your old man died. On the cross, 2,000 years ago, the old man was buried in a tomb. The old man went into hell with Jesus, and he left it there. The sin nature in you is dead. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Man. So, what is holiness? Holiness is wholeness. Holiness, Charles Spurgeon says it this way. He says, holiness is the harmony of all virtues. The Lord has not one glorious attribute alone or in excess, but all glories are in him as a whole. This is the crown of his honor and the honor of his crown. His power is not his choicest jewel not his sovereignty. His choicest jewel is his holiness. In this all-comprehensive moral excellence, he would have his creatures take delight. And when they do so, their delight is evidence that their hearts have been renewed and they themselves have been made partakers of his holiness. We have become partakers of God's holiness. We have become partakers of the divine nature. We have become partakers of his eternal life. Eternal. There is no reason for us to have lack in our life. Now, that material things... I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about this wholeness, this peace that passes all understanding, this knowing that you are loved, this, this embracing that he has done of us that isn't swayed by circumstances. This joy that he's put within us that isn't moved when things go wrong. It isn't moved when we see things happening in the world. He has placed us within himself. God is not worried today. Not worried tomorrow. God's not worried. God's at perfect peace. And he has placed that spirit within you. So there's no room for worry. There's only room for rest. And God wants you to rest in his wholeness. 
because his wholeness is your wholeness. His completeness is your completeness. Holiness means perfection in the sense of completeness. So when Jesus said, be holy, he was inviting us to become partakers of his life of wholeness and perfection with the Father. We partake of his life. We partake of his perfection. We partake of his peace. We partake of his goodness. We partake of his self-sufficiency. So how do we walk this out? You know, how do we how do we do this thing? You know, the Bible says be holy, and we have all these verses that call us holy people. So what I want you to do is when you open up the word of God and you see the word holy or you see the word sanctified, I want you to change it in your mind to the word whole or complete. It will give, see, I have a hard time saying I'm holy. I don't know if you do, but I do. I have a hard time wrapping my mind around that because of the teaching we've received, because of the, you know, just because I live. I know what I do. So I have a hard time saying, looking in the mirror and saying, Elaine, you are holy. It takes no faith at all when I mess up to say, Elaine, you blew it again. <laughs> worthless, worthless. That takes no faith at all. It takes great faith for me to look in the mirror when I've messed up and say, I'm holy. So for me, if I'll take that word holy in scripture and I change it, and instead of saying holy, I can look in the mirror and say, in him I am complete. For me, somehow that is just easier to swallow. And it's just as good. In Jesus, I'm whole. I lack nothing. In him, I'm complete. It just makes it easier for me. So, let me see. When you come across verses, and I wrote a few of them down here. So, um, in a verse like 1 Corinthians 1 2, in the King James, it says, Unto the church of God, which is in Corinth, to them who are sanctified in Christ Jesus. See, if I just change that, I say, Unto the church of God, which is in Corinth, to them that are complete in Christ Jesus. Because that's what we are, we're complete in Him. I have no problem believing that Jesus is complete. And if I can just remember that I am in him, I have no problem believing that I am complete. I lack nothing. In Ephesians 4.24 it says, that ye put on the new man which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Well, just change that which after God is created in righteousness and true wholeness, true completeness. That's who you are, whole and complete in Christ Jesus. And like 1 Peter 2.9, but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, well, let's change that. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a whole nation. That's, that's, that's what the word holy means. It means whole. It means complete. Romans 6.22, But now being made free from sin and becoming servants to God, 
Ye have your fruits unto holiness, and the end everlasting life. Ye have your fruit unto wholeness. See, we need to see that picture of wholeness. We need to look at Jesus and see his wholeness and recognize that his wholeness is ours. That whatever he is, as he is, right now, seated at the right hand of God the Father, so are we in this world. Jesus is seated at, seated at the right hand of God the Father. He is whole. He is complete. There's no pain in him, there's no lack in him, there's no anxiety in him, there's no worry in him, there's no sickness in him. There is nothing in him that is not whole and complete and perfect. And that's how you are, because you are in him. And God would have us rest in that. You know, Roman, or John 10.10 10 says that the thief comes but to steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and that more abundantly. And God came, Jesus came so that you could have his abundant life. That word abundant means super abundance. Beyond abundance. More than enough abundance. God came, Jesus came, so that you could have life super abundant. So that you could be whole. So that you could be complete. So that you could rest. God wants us to identify with him. Now, 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, that talks about us being kings and priests. I wanted to close by reading the Passion Translation of 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10, because it's so good. So in verse 9 it says, But you are God's chosen treasure, priest, who are kings, a spiritual nation set apart as God's devoted ones. He called you out of darkness to experience his marvelous light, and now he claims you as his very own. He did this so that you would broadcast his glorious wonders throughout the world. For at one time you were not God's people, but now you are. At one time, you knew nothing of God's mercy because you hadn't received it yet. But now, you are drenched with it. You are drenched with God's mercy. Amen. You are drenched with God's mercy. You are drenched with his wholeness. You are complete with his holiness. You are complete with his wholeness. You have been made perfect through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And God does not want you to forget that. That's why we received communion today. So that you would not forget who you are in Christ Jesus. So that you would not forget that the work is finished. And you are forever perfect in Christ, forever loved, forever cherished, forever his, with no lack, Amen. with all sufficiency available to you because you have a father who loves you. You have a father who completes you. And he wants us to walk in it. Hallelujah. Yes. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your gift of righteousness. And we thank you, Father, for making us holy. For making us whole and complete in Christ Jesus. 
Father God, help us to remember that when the world tells us we lack. Help us to remember that when thoughts put us in turmoil, when circumstances look dark. Help us to remember who we are. But more importantly, Father, help us to remember who you are. And help us remember that your love for us is unwavering and unchanging and will always come through. We give you praise for that in Jesus' name.